Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for today. It's gorgeously sunny. We've been in your presence, we've prayed and we've heard your heart. Lord, I want to pray now that as we look at your word, you will help us to understand what it is that you are saying to us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, proper good morning to you this morning. We, um, we're going to sort of jump in to, sorry, I'm actually cheerful, I'm just tired, so bear with me a minute. Uh, we had the wedding yesterday of Ray and Fiona, and it was a brilliant wedding. Um, so uh, so just, uh, just bear with me just a second. Um, we're going to be looking at Mark, but we're not going to be following on from where we've just left off. We're going to jump, leap, expand ourselves into Mark 14. We're going to start off with the passion narrative. Why? Well, I'm not preaching next week. Timmy is. And Timmy can do whatever God's given him to do. So we'll probably look at the book of Revelation. And... Um, and uh, for those who are not seeing on the camera you should see his look right now and, uh, but we were going to jump in because we, we get to the Easter weekend and we sort of rush through Maundy Thursday, by the way there is no Maundy Thursday service meeting this year because of the winter night shelter so we will not be reflecting on the last supper together, mind you I think Jesus would be rather doing what we are doing yeah. yes so, just to let you know that, there's not that. We then rush into Good Friday, go up the top of the mounds at North Isle Fields. Yes, we're doing that this year. Reflecting on, on, on Good Friday. Then we do Easter Sunday and all the praise and celebration of the resurrection. We have two baptisms. We have a Sunday fun day. That's Easter done. That's our year done. And we do the narrative, we normally start off at the Last Supper. And I think we miss a particular event that happened because we rush around. And that's in Mark chapter 14, verses 1 to 14. So I want to set the scene, though the two scenes effectively are not related, but, they are, uh, but Mark has got one following on for the other. Jesus has just spent some time speaking against the temple in Jerusalem, predicting the fact that, you know, effectively one stone will not be on top of another. Uh, he was predicting or prophesying that it is going to get destroyed in the, uh, in, the, in the rustle and the tussle in AD 66 to AD 70, the terrible war that happened there. But also people also see that as a double meaning that he's also talking about the end times as well. But he was speaking against the temple. We then have Mark taking us straight into another one of Mark's good sandwiches. You know the Mark and sandwich? Where the filling is meant to tell us something either side of the two slices of bread. And what we have here is that the fact we have the plotting of... I will give you the summary of chapter 14 now, or part of it. But it's the plotting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law to kill Jesus for continued power over the people and the plotting of Judas to betray Jesus for money. And all this with a filling of how your reaction to Jesus really should be. So, we'll get on straight away. So Mark chapter 14, 1 to 2. Sorry, I've not put the words up because I can't be bothered to fight with the laptop. I will be honest and real. It was now two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The leading priests and the teachers of religious law were still looking for an opportunity to capture Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the Passover celebration, they agreed, or the people may riot. Well, it was Passover. This was the time that the Jewish nation collated together on a yearly basis, come and remember the release and the escape from the Egyptian captors by God through Moses. We know that one because we read it in Exodus. The festival can only be held in Jerusalem and therefore there was an annual pilgrimage by many for the surrounding areas for the festival. 
the population of Jerusalem increased greatly. Strangely enough, that's what happens, isn't it? It's like holiday destinations, you know. Seaside resorts in the middle of the baking hot summer that we get in England. Oh, sorry, let me wake up. The occasional sun we might get in England. I still go camping. So there was a massive increase in the population. The Romans put on extra security then for fear that there's an uprising by the Jewish people. Because the Jews were known as a rebellious people. Didn't take to occupation of their land very, very well. You know, they believed that the land was God-given. And therefore then they would normally struggle and fight hard against the oppressors. Now why is that? Well, it's born out of the fact that they understand their identity as God's own chosen people. This is the land that our Lord has given us. It's ours. So they have no problem in standing up for it. They're not going to cow down to the oppression of the Roman army and take it all on the chin. They used to be quite rebellious. They believed that they had a right to this inheritance as land and a right to defend it. We believe, do we not, that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it? Psalm 24, yes? Yes. yes. Thank you, Steve. And therefore then, if it is the Lord's and we are God's people, are we not? Yes. Then we have a right to go and reclaim the ground. We have a right to stand up for God's word and truth. And we do that in the authority and the understanding that we are God's people. If you struggle to understand that you're God's own, you're going to struggle to do the rest. Sometimes you discover you're God's own when you step out in faith, like that song we were singing, Oceans. You know, take me where my feet might fail, but at least I'm willing to step out. And then sometimes you learn that you are actually God's own. Look at what happened two weeks ago when I preached on Jesus sending out the 12 in his authority. They were gobsmacked. They were like, oh my life, demons even bowed down to your name. There was healing. They had to, I feel they had to have a little bit of a shove. Sort of Jesus saying, trust me guys, I'm sending you out. I know what I'm doing. And sometimes we have to trust that God knows what he's doing. When he says, could you go and do this? And you're going, oh, no, 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 I don't do that. No, no, that's not me. I'm, I'm not, that's not my thing. Or I'm not gifted that way. I'm not at the right training. God's going, trust me. It's got nothing to do with you. It's to do with me. Go out. And go out recognising that you are my child. So I like that about the Jewish nation. They didn't really care. They would stand up. This is our land. God gave this to us. So when God says to us, by the way, I've given you the streets of Greenford. I've given you your workplaces, your homes. You can run in that confidence. Now you run in that confidence of who you are in him. I'm a gobby what's it. Yes? So you can give an amen to that, yes. Yeah, the pastor's loud. You know, I'm, I'm not exactly subtle. The wedding yesterday, somebody actually saw my yellow mini and went, you're not quiet, are you? No. <laughs> and therefore then I have no problem in being bold and, and, and brassy and, and whatever else. You know, I have my fearful places, but generally on the whole, I have no problem. Because that's me. There's others here. You're not me. Say amen. amen. One of me is enough in the entire universe. <laughs> but guess what? One of you's enough in the entire universe. God makes us all unique. And actually what that means is that actually you may not be a what about Jesus, but you're quiet, you're subtle. You spend time with people. But that still doesn't mean you can't be bold when God says, I now want you to tell this person you're having a nice, quiet conversation with about me. I want you to pray for healing for them. Works both ways. It's about running in the boldness of who, who we are. The boldness that we are God's chosen. 
Boldness doesn't always mean gobby. Being a warrior doesn't mean being loud and visual all the time. But it is about being bold in who you are in Christ. Get the difference? Okay. So we need to be bold to stand up against injustice, oppression, engage in truth telling of the spreading of the gospel. Not everybody does it loud. So we have some plotting going on as well by the Jewish uh, religious leaders. I love the irony of this, by the way. Uh, they're plotting quietly and trying to capture Jesus secretly and kill him. And, uh, but not during the Passover, the people might riot. So they're worried now that the people might riot against them. They don't care if the people riot against the Romans, but they're a bit worried that they're going to riot against them. If they try and capture this great man that clearly the people really love. And what I also like about this, if you think for one moment you're doing the right thing by the plumb line of Jesus, by God's plumb line, if you think you're doing the right thing, why do you have to do it secretly or hide it? If you think you need to hide something from everybody else or plot something in secret behind everybody's, unless of course you're plotting a secret, surprise, nice, pleasant party. <laughs> but if you think you've got to plot something that's evil, no, that's no hint. <laughs> if you're, no, what would that be a hint? I've got nothing special coming up. Not for at least another 10 years. Um, 10 years, I mean, like, no. So if, um, it, yeah, if, if, if you think that you've got to plot something or hide something, that should ring alarm bells with you. Hmm, maybe God doesn't want me to do that. Now that's the irony of this. Not once did they think we're trying to kill this man, plot to get him captured and, and kill him. Alarm bells should have been ringing off for them, going, hang on a minute. If we've got to do it quietly, we're worried about our own people who are actually quite scared of us, actually, because we hold such sway within the community. But we've got to hide it from them as well. Maybe we're not doing what God wants us to do. Do you get the... And the same thing can run for us. So I just thought I'd throw that in there in the pot. If you've got to do something hiddenly, you've got to try and keep it really private and secret. Unless, of course, it's a nice surprise for someone. I might need to think about, is this of God that I'm doing this? Or is this of my own understanding? Anyway, that's that. Let's go into the narrative that uh, we tend to sometimes skip. Verses 3 to 9. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume, made from essence of nard. She broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. Some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. So they scolded her harshly. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want to. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for the burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. Remembered and discussed, not remembered in disgust. Just making sure that my... I realise as you say, you think, that could have come at two ways. Anyway, this story is recounted in Matthew and John a little bit more verbatim. It's, it's also partially, but it's so completely different. We've just, just got to be cautious with it, so I'm not going to go there. But Matthew most certainly would have taken this story from Mark's Gospel, and therefore that's why it's much closer in rendition. John has the story set in Bethany, but he sort of marks it as being at Lazarus' house with Martha and Mary, and Mary being uh, the woman with the perfume. Simon the leper 
could have been here in Mark's retelling, could well have been Lazarus' father. There was a possibility. Um, so we will take that forward when we're looking at this. So verse 3, Jesus was either eating or reclining. Either way, he was at home. He was in hospitality. He was being in good company. And then in comes, by Mark's telling, an unknown, unnamed woman with a beautifully crafted alabaster jar, onyx marble. Just, just think about it. It's crafted. It was very beautiful. I like anything to do with rocks and stone and all that. I, anyway, if you've been in my office, you'll see. Some people walk in and think I'm into that sort of like crystal healing stuff if you walk in. I'm not. I've been collecting rocks out of the ground since I was a kid, all right? I just like them. I think they're attractive. I think some beautiful rocks are so beautifully crafted and have been buried in the ground for millions of years. And our Lord has made sure they've been crafted and look that gorgeous that nobody else will see them until they're dug out the ground. What an amazing, creative, artist God that we worship. So we look at the stars and the skies and the birds and all that. Think, oh, well. But underneath in this rock is gorgeous stuff as well. I just thought I'd just... Anyway... I walk into my office and, huh, nothing to do with onyx marble or the alabaster jar. So a good piece, and nard that was in this jar is an expensive fragrance from India. So let's put this into context slightly. Uh, maybe to give you an idea, this jar we know would have been worth about a labourer's year's worth of wages. So this expensive perfume from India uh, was expensive. So it was expensive. So let's try and put it in today a little bit as well. That might help us. So this is a question for you. Let's try and understand perfume then to perfume now. So I'm going to ask the question, men, what's the latest, most expensive perfume for women called? Come on, men, you're bound to have looked it up. Let's go. Steve. <laughs> Do you wish to remain married to Wendy? <laughs> no, for women, Steve. No, Steve, that's the spice she puts in the food that she cooks you. Gucci. Do you know how much it is? No. No, exactly. And it's not Gucci is the most expensive, believe it or not. I'm not trying to advertise for this company, by the way. I'm not getting any shares. I did email them so I can have 10%. It's going to be videoed and put on the internet. But no. No? Anybody? Oh, Dennis has done a quick look. I'm going to switch off the internet. You know that. Go on. Florence Honey. How much is it? 160 quid. No, still not the most expensive. Ready? Ready? It's called... Men, listen up. Ladies, listen up. You might want to ask your man to buy it for you. Clive Christian. That's funny, isn't it? Clive Christian. Number one for women. And it costs, for 50 millilitres, £450. Only. There was another perfume, and I wasn't quite sure about it, that was in the thousands, but I didn't want to quote that one. So that's uh, Clive Christian, number one for women. £450. So imagine taking that bottle. So just imagine that. Imagine taking that bottle, smashing the neck of it, so you can't even sell the bottle on eBay afterwards and then pouring the contents of this perfume for women all over a man. <laughs> just imagine that just for a minute. Can you do that? Imagine that. So you've gone out to, and I know what shops you can buy it in, by the way. There's a big one in Brent Cross that might be related to the fourth gospel and got something to do with Lewis. Anyway. <laughs> going there, paying for it, and let's be honest, you'd hand over the credit card quicker than you could. And then, but the whole point of it is, you're then coming up 
to somebody you think is worthy, you crack it open, so no going back, once the, the bottle's smashed, it's worth nothing. Because, you know, you can get these perfume bottles, can't you, that you can, though they're empty, you can sell them. I mean, normally they're antiques, sort of art deco ones, 1930s, subtle hint from me, um, that you can buy just for the bottle shape. And uh, you can buy them. Imagine that same thing, that you've broken this to the point that even 50 years from now, it can never be sold ever again on eBay. So you can't ever recoup the money back in any way, shape or form. And then, it's for women, but you don't. You stick it all over a man. So imagine that for a minute. I would not like the perfume, thank you. No, do you know what I have to do? You know, you know the perfume counters and all that sort of thing? I have to run through them. I can't, the smell gets, I just, sorry, don't say that the wrong way. I love the smell of perfume, but not the mixture. I have to, anyway, that's enough about me. What do you want to know what my senses are? So imagine doing that. Now, why would she do this? It's a real question. Why would she do this? I've just realized something. I wonder if it's getting hot in here. Why would she do this? She's recognised who he is. Say again. She has recognised who he is. Okay. She didn't care about the perfume. She cared about her love for Christ. Okay. Sorry, is this the new secret sitting place? Because she had, that was the best thing that she had to give. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Cool. She was being bold in her own way. She was being bold in her own way, yeah. We're going to come to all of that. Brilliant. Right. By the way, there are cheaper perfumes on the market. Beyonce Heat, £7.80. <laughs> Why bother using a family heirloom? Well, you've given all the answers. <laughs> You have no idea what one has to do sometimes to prepare for a sermon. <laughs> Seriously, if you looked at my Google search on, on the thing, you'll be sitting there going, really? Yeah, yeah, sometimes I have to do this to make it related. No, no, I did not go out and try. <laughs> when I go and do talks at schools, it's like, what's the 10 best toys for Christmas at the moment? You know, you see all that, and I'm not looking for buying a toy. <laughs> anyway, so... It's all of those things. Did you know, by the way, that prior to even her coming in and breaking open the neck of the bottle and pouring it all, she'd already broken already a societal rule. She'd broken in on the men's fellowship time. Come on. That's like a woman breaking in on men behaving godly. Really? But she had. She actually breached social etiquette by doing that. Women were only allowed to go and enter to where the men were socialising when they're coming in to serve the food to the men. And all the men go, amen. No, they don't? Okay, that's good. Not if they, <laughs> if they value their lives. <laughs> so she'd already broken that rule. So there was that boldness, as Wendy had put it. That boldness before she even did anything with the perfume. That's quite something. Again, for me, there's a lesson to be learned. That sometimes doing the God thing means that social barriers don't exist. I just want to look back over some of the verses as we go. Four to five. Some of the table were indignant. By the way, that's flaring of nostrils indignancy. That's what that means. Why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. So they scolded her harshly. Well, we see the reason, and by the way, this was the disciples, as we know, that were doing this. So this is the disciples of Jesus. By the way, this is the final sort of week of Jesus. Well, it's not even that, it's the final few days. So they've been with Jesus three years. They still haven't learnt a lot. We could be cruel to them and be nasty to them and say, gosh, these disciples, did they never get it? Then do yourself a favour, put a mirror up, <laughs> and then repeat the stuff. Now the reason given, 
was that the poor, it could be sold and given to the poor. Well, were they really being truthful about that? Is it the poor they were really thinking of? One of the commentators I put read, Siampa, says, we cannot know whether their indignation is owing to genuine concern for the poor or whether, as is often the case, the poor are simply used as a pretext for other motives. Those motives for me normally are, I want the money myself, or the money should go on my agenda. Or go to something I want to see happen. And by the way, just as a side, well, it's more of a sideline. This is more of the teaching for me. And actually, by their reaction to this and their harsh treatment of the woman, they are saying that her gift makes Jesus less than. This perfume is more than Jesus. And her gift to Jesus is less than, is not enough for Jesus. So they're actually doing two things. It's a bit confusing, but actually both their reactions, they are actually saying that Jesus is not worthy of such a gift. Actually, to use the money for anything other than a gift you might want to bring to Jesus, they're saying that Jesus just isn't worth it. They got their priorities right and royally wrong. As a rhetorical question to you, what have I or you, where have I or you demeaned Christ by stating that money spent on something that he has asked for to occur, we've then deemed it as a waste of money afterwards? Rhetorical question for us to ponder, especially in our society, money seems to run just about everything. And it does in Christian circles, I'm afraid. That's why it always says in the Bible, we can't serve both God and money. Notice the fact I have said I as well. I don't just say you. I always include all my sermons, myself in it. So an interesting reaction by his own disciples who spent three years with him. I would like to ponderly say... And in one of the other Gospels, it clearly looks like it well was Judas sort of led the pack in this, uh, this, this, this uh, scolding of her. And we wonder why, don't we? Verses 6 to 8, Jesus says, Leave her alone. Why criticise her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, and you can help them ever you want to. But you will not always have me. She's done what she could and has anointed my body for the burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached... No, no, not that line. We'll come to that later. Burial ahead of time. Verse 7, I just want to say this. Verse 7 is the one that you will always have the poor among you and you can help them whenever you want to, but you'll not always have me. Uh, some people have always taken that as, as Jesus sort of dismissing... You couldn't take that as Jesus dismissing the poor. Really? Could you imagine that? Jesus dismissing the poor. The whole Old Testament is all based on what you should do to help the poor, the widow, etc. So that is definitely not going on. It's here there's some sort of... He's saying actually he's more having a go at them in their attitude towards the woman. You can help the poor whenever you want to. Just this one moment... This one moment, if you really were that concerned about Paul, you could help them whenever you want. This one moment, there is a reason this is happening. How dare you? You're having a go at her, quite frankly, probably because you're not doing stuff that you should be doing anyway. It's that sort of imagery. Uh, there's some other stuff behind that, but we haven't got time to unpack all of that because I don't believe that's the central focus for today's teaching. So Jesus' response is to tell off his disciples. Nothing unusual there then. Leave her alone. Note, by the way, he never talks to the woman. And if it's Mary, he doesn't talk to her as well when she's sitting at his feet, when Martha has a go. Have you noticed that? Just thought I'd throw that out there. 
By the way, Jesus doesn't spend his entire time telling us off. I just thought I'd mention that in passing. You don't spend three years with someone if they spend their entire time telling you off, do, do you? No. I think he probably occasionally had to correct them somewhat, occasionally. But I think the majority of the time, all he did was spend his entire time telling them who they were in the Father, in him. Anyway, you with me so far? Good. Criticising for doing such a beautiful thing. You're seeing what she's doing through human eyes and understanding, not God's eyes. There's an element here of Mark 8, 31 to 38, and I shall just quickly take us to that. I say quickly when I can get my fingers through the pages. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, and, but for three days later he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. I do like Peter, he's bold as brass. Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples and he reprimanded Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If any of you must be my followers, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you gave up, give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? If anything worth more than your soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in glory of his Father with the holy angels. Again, the disciples just didn't get it. He told them ages ago that he knew he had to die that he would be betrayed to the religious leaders. He'd given them more than enough warning, but as per usual, like me, I'm sure, we see things sometimes through human eyes and human understanding. And he has to tell them off. They did not seem to appear, don't forget at this point, the disciples think they're following some sort of warrior type Messiah. And what that means is kick out the Romans. In violence. That's what they saw it as. What they don't see to see the king in com ki coming kingdom in is actually it involves suffering. Suffering is part of seeing the kingdom of God come in. They didn't understand, so they did nothing to prepare Jesus for it. They didn't get it at all. They didn't prepare him for burial in any way, shape or form. But this unknown woman did and started preparing Jesus for suffering, uh, for, for his death and his burial. She's able to see that suffering brings in the kingdom of God. She sees for me a personal, no holds barred, Rubicon River moment, no ploughing looking back. This is it. I am going to go whole hog for God's plan here in doing everything I just did at this moment. Broke that jar, suffered the ridicule of the disciples having a go at her. She sees suffering as something that is part of the kingdom of God. if it is Mary she would have known the disciples for at least the last three years ready for this so she they would have been around their house as we know plenty of times you don't become a friend of Lazarus if you're not around there a lot it's no good saying well somebody's a friend of mine but you don't see him for three years if they live abroad we understand that and modern communication is marvellous now So there she is with what I would suggest are men that she knows. I would possibly consider them in one form or another, at least a friendship group. So to be doing a God thing, 
and then being criticised by your own friends for it, people who have known you for years, I think that brings real suffering to a person. Yeah? That's suffering for the kingdom of God. Sometimes, even with our own friends, we have to suffer criticism when we're doing the God thing. We like to avoid suffering in our society. Everything's about being happy. Avoid unhappiness at all costs. I've yet to see one day an advertiser advertise something and say, this will make you suffer. <laughs> but in the long term, for eternity, it's perfect. Don't worry, it's worth buying. Could you, would you go and buy it then? No, of course you wouldn't. Guess what you did when you became a Christian? You bought the suffering. You think I'm joking, but you did. I used to make me laugh. Um, many years ago, when I first come to this church, there were the, the little leaflet rack that's just out there. Um, it used to have leaflet racks of how to become a Christian and how to do the prayer. It was those sorts of little pamphlet things. And, um, and it, it, the, the sign's still on there. Not the leaflets anymore, but the sign says, take a, please take a leaflet. It's free. And I used to one day come and go, no, it's not. You're giving over your life to Christ. You're going to suffer for like X, X, X. But it's well worth the retirement plan. But it's concept that it's free. It's like, no, not really. But it is because actually you're not free until you do give your life to Christ. You're actually a walking dead person. So, part of the kingdom is actually suffering. And let's be honest, we all want to avoid it like the plague. Because our Western society tells us, be happy. Now, there's nothing wrong with being happy. There's nothing wrong with being joyful. I love being happy. I do. Just doesn't look that often. Does it, love? And... Um, you know, but you've got to recognise walking with Christ at times would involve real suffering because it's not about you, because God uses that suffering to reach others. Because when people know that you're going through hard times and suffering, but see how your faith is holding up, how you have a long-term hope in Christ, that's when people go, gosh, I want what you got. I've been sold on that advertisement. I'll have it, please. And it doesn't happen instantly. I wished it did. Sometimes it takes years with people. But following Christ does involve suffering. Now, I've always wanted, when I wondered and I pondered on this passage, I wonder if after Jesus' death and resurrection, the disciples ever went up to Mary and apologised. I wonder if they ever went up after and apologised for what they said. Because sometimes we need to do that when we might have moaned about something and then seen God at work in it afterwards. We might need to go back to those that we moan to and say, I was wrong, you were right, I'm sorry. People need to hear that encouragement as well. By the way, just for anybody thinks it's not something I'm asking for, a personal reaction to me or anything, I, I'm just saying. Another thing to note here, that she is commended by Jesus for what she's able to do. I think Jenny put it like this. This was a really expensive jar of perfume. And it's really easy to see this moment in isolation and sort of say to myself, well, unless I can afford the biggest and the best or something for Jesus, give her the best of everything, give, you know, I don't know, 40 hours a week to Jesus in ministry or whatever, then it's not worth giving it at all. It's not going to be an acceptable uh, act of worship to God. You see the point? Unless I can give 10% of my monthly income, however that comes, through benefits or whatever, unless I can do that, then it's just not worth doing at all. It's not going to be accepted. But 
We look at chapter 12, verse 41 to 44. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts and a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to them and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making the contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. Both people, the one that gave two pennies and the one who gave the 450 pound Clive Christian number one for women. I've even remembered it. It's going well, isn't it? Joy's not getting it, by the way. Um, Okay. Nor's my mum. So, unless I get older, my dad. Anyway, the... um, Gave those two contrasting, but both got the same commendation from Jesus. Both got the same praise. Why is that? Real question. Why is that? The answer is really quite simple, ultimately. Why is that? Because they both gave willingly from their hearts, cheerfully. Absolutely, Hannah. They both gave willingly from their heart. It was heart motivation. It's never about the size of the gift for God. It's about your heart. What is it? Why do you want to give this? What's the reason beyond you giving of your time or giving money or whatever it is? By the way, it's never your actual time, by the way. It's never actually your money. It's actually God's. But it's never, actually, it's about your heart motivation. I did something on, um, at, uh, at the fellowship this week. I was taking the service this week. and I, I, uh, It's the time of the, uh, the offering that we normally do. And um, normally it's why we're singing a hymn of worship that the, the offering bags go out and they put their money in. Isn't that right, Doral? Others that come to the uh, thing. Well, this week, I decided we're going to change it slightly. And what we actually did, didn't I, Dorothy? I stuck on, we are family. Yes, they copped it again. I stuck in my head. But we stuck it on, and they were laughing and dancing. We're giving it a, and it was great as we're putting the money in. And halfway through, they all thought, why are we doing this? And I said, because you have to give hilariously. It's amazing you're giving out of humour, and you're loving, you don't mind. You're, you're smiling while you're doing this. Yes? Which, by the way, it says in the Bible. It's something John bangs on about all the time. But it's absolutely true. Isn't that right, John? Bangs on it about But it is true. You, you are meant to give hilariously. You're meant to give with a sense of heart motivation of, yes, I really want to do this. Mary, smashing bottle open, pouring on event. I want to do this for Jesus because I love him. It's that heart motivation. It's that heart motivation. Why do we do good works? And I put that in inverted commas. Why do we do good works? Do we do it out of our love for Christ or out of a need for feeling good? They're two totally different things. Why do we do something? If you're doing it out of the need for feeling good, it won't last very long. Or do I want to be seen as a caring person? Verse 9. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. Duh. So I said, in Matthew and Mark, she is unnamed. The act itself will be remembered and told this morning, will be discussed for hundreds of years. But her name is unimportant as far as Mark is concerned. God knows who she is, who she was. She knows who she was. Her act was born out of a love for Christ. It most certainly wasn't born out of an act of self-fulfillment. You don't give up effectively what is a family heirloom. And she didn't do it to gratify some deep damaged hole that she has. She did it because she recognised that suffering for the kingdom is what's needed. She recognised that she wholeheartedly loves Christ and wants to follow him. And at that point, she only got a glimmer. Don't forget, this was pre-death and resurrection. 
She wanted to do it wholeheartedly because she recognised that's where her future lied. Consumerism. Terrible link, I know, but bear with me. The reaction of the disciples, I would say, is an early form of consumerism. I.e., we want the bottle. If we're honest, we're probably not going to give the money to the poor. It will fund ministry for another year. They wanted it for its financial value, for their sense of leave it there. Look, let come people to look at your beautiful jar full of expensive nard from India. Come round my house, see the new thing I've just bought. This is my new TV. It's 60 inches wide. Therefore, then come to my house, because I've got to have one heck of a big wall about to fit that on there. Consumerism is the greatest sin of the Western world. The desire to feel a longing in our self-worth that only God can fulfil. In the five-minute buying frenzy that we do, and it turns into a five-minute wonder. And it makes me laugh. We sit there and say, kids, when we give them toys, it's a five-minute wonder. Yeah? Come on, you know that. Oh, it's a five-minute wonder. You give them the late, they want it, they're desperate for it, they want the latest thing they've seen advertised, and it's a five-minute wonder. They put it down and walk away from it. Guess what? Look in the mirror. We all do it. We all do it. And it's actually born out of the fact that we're trying to fulfill a hole that only God can fill. That's why it's never satisfying. That's why you want to then buy the next thing. And we do it to fulfill a heart problem that we have. The same goes with doing good works. If it's not born out of a love for God and what God has specifically commanded you to do, well, you ain't going to believe this, but it's actually sin. Because if you're not doing it because you want to do it because you're doing it out of love for God, if you're doing good works, it can become consumerism. You're doing it to fulfill a hole in you. You're not doing it to do something that God wants you to do. You're not giving in it hilariously. Do you understand the difference? And I'm not knocking doing good works. Hear me carefully. And I'm not sitting in there where he's going to start stressing about all the things they do at the moment and start stressing over, oh, my life, am I doing this out of my love for Christ or I'm doing it because I should be doing it or, or, or you know, just, just settle that down for a minute. <laughs> but you do need to check our heart motivation. Why do we do anything? It should be born out of our identity in Christ. Why were the Romans able, why are the Jews able to rise up and rebel against the Jews? Uh, against the Romans? Oh, I'm really anti. Against the, Jew, uh, the Romans? Well, because of where they knew their identity in God rested. Slightly um, now, by the time Jesus' death and resurrection, misplaced. But nonetheless, they knew who they were. So they did that, born out of who they knew they were. So when we do good things, when we do charitable, out in the community works, praying for people, spending time with people, I know, doing stuff in the church, etc., we do it as an act of worship. Not to feel good. Yeah, hopefully you do feel a little bit like, well, I'm doing what God wants me to do. But if you're doing it as an identity filler, that's not the reason to do it. You do it because God loves you. And now I've got a whole raft of people think, oh good, I'll quit, quit that rotor in the church. I'll quit that one now because I can try and pretend past that. I don't expect to see any emails this week. But I'm saying doing good works can almost be like an act of consumerism. For here, for this unknown woman, it was actually about doing it for Jesus. She didn't care what the disciples thought. She didn't care about the fact that she's just given up the family inheritance because there was a bigger inheritance for her. And you can see that because now, in this element of this consumerist act, 
is we now have, because sometimes we do this stuff with God because, well, it makes us look good. And really you're doing it love for myself rather than love for my neighbour. And Judas's reaction is one that I think would tell us something. Judas's reaction tells us in his mind, I'm following Jesus for what I can get out of it. Then he suddenly discovers after this moment that his little agenda is never going to be fulfilled. So this is how he now reacts. Verses 10 to 11. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priest to arrange to portray Jesus to them. They were delighted when they heard why he had come and they promised to give him money. So he began looking for an opportunity to portray Jesus. You think about that. Now, it's seen that Judas is uh, the old money dipper, would take coins out for himself. So, of course, when he sees this beautiful, I wonder if this was the, the camel that broke the back. He saw the straw that broke the camel's back. We'll get there in the end. But saw that jar and then Jesus not having a go about it, he probably thought, that's it, I'm never going to make any money out of this venture. So we have the final part of the Mark and Sandwich, attacking the leader. So not only is the leader, Jesus, being attacked from the outside by the religious uh, law, by the religious leaders, he's now being attacked from the inside by his own people. Now, other Gospels have it here that Satan entered into Judas and inspired him to do this. Mark doesn't do that. Mark firmly lays the blame at Judas's feet. It's his responsibility. So easy, isn't it, to blame somebody else for your actions? Yeah? If you notice that, if you do something bad, you blame somebody else. If you do something good, it's all you. Seriously, so easy. It's not my fault. Car accident wasn't my fault. He broke for no reason. Well, she broke. She slammed on her anchors for no reason that I could tell. That's why I went into the back of her when I was checking my hair out in the mirror. <laughs> yes, that was me. 1990, was it 1994, Mum, Joy? Something like that. When the Belmont finally gave up the ghost. The reason I'm asking Joy, I wasn't dating Joy then, but she would have to pull out of her road out here while I was waiting at the bus stop and I had this sort of dewy-eyed look saying, please give me a lift into Hillingdon. She used to have to stop. I don't know why I'm telling you that. Just lighten the mood a little bit because it's quite miserable. You know. But the point is, I did. I, and I went, why did you break for no reason? Why was I looking in the mirror checking out? I had more hair then. Why was I in the mirror checking out my hair? I'm being honest about it. That's all. None of us were injured, which was a blessing. But I, could have, I did blame her and it was my fault. End of story. The tree, tree jumped out at me. Yeah, reversed into a tree in East Mead Avenue a week after passing my driving test. By the way, anybody want to lift this afternoon anywhere? <laughs> I haven't had an accident over 20 years. We're all right now. But we blame somebody else for our actions and our sin. We can blame especially Satan. Satan's attacking me. Oh, that's the good line, isn't it? Oh, Satan's attacking me. Oh, Satan's doing this. No, he's not. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen? Okay, so guess what? If you're going to blame a human being for causing you to do something wrong, or you're going to blame Satan for doing something, causing you to do something wrong, guess what you're saying? They're more powerful than God. No, you choose, I choose to sin. He who is in me, who's greater than he who's in the world. Holy Spirit, you can actually know, you walk your entire life from here on in now, sinless. Do you know that? Christ did it. Christ did it in the power of the Holy Spirit. He didn't do it as being God. He did it in the power of the Holy Spirit. You from here on today can walk out of here, walking out sinless. 
Well, you are sinless because, anyway, we won't even go there. You're forgiven, and, and anyway, you're a saint. But the point is, we blame others for what is our error. Why? Because we weren't listening to our Father and we wasn't recognising our identity in Christ at that moment when we made that decision. Don't give power to Satan that he doesn't have over your life. Don't give power to him. He's been defeated, remember? So don't give him any power. And most certainly don't give power to another fellow human being. Please! We're all weak. So here we have Judas making his own decision. Why would he attack someone who's done nothing being good to him? Why attack someone who's done nothing and betray someone who's done nothing be be good to you? Why do we do that? Judas's reaction should have been like that of the unnamed woman. She recognised there was a no return policy in regards to her relationship with Jesus. When she broke that expensive jar, she just knew there was no return. This, I have committed to Christ, or Jesus as she would have known him at that moment, I have committed to Jesus wholeheartedly. If you're in this room, you come under that category when you got baptised. Once you commit to the Lord, there is no compromise. Don't, yeah. By the way, if you do sin, don't beat yourself up neither. That's the other thing. Sorry, we do fall into this trap in Christianity of beating ourselves up no end. Once you've said, I'm sorry, that's it, you're forgiven, move on. I keep saying this. Once you've said, I'm sorry for something, move on. So, the three things that I have gone over by two minutes, I'm sorry. Following the ways of Jesus will, should involve suffering. If he's our example, yes? Two, we need to check our heart motivation. Let's see if we're doing it hilariously, whatever we are doing. And because we've committed to him, there should never be for us a sense of return. We've committed to Christ, there is no return. He committed to us with no sense of casting us out, so we need to make sure we're committed to him, knowing there is no sense of return back. And all from a little jar of alabaster. Or Clive Christian number one. For women. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, Heavenly Father, we do recognize sometimes within your word it is tough teaching. But Lord, we find it tough because we still find it tough to recognise our identity in you and the freedom that we have in you. I want to pray for each of us, Lord, that just like the unnamed woman, we can be people who are mentally, spiritually, emotionally free in you. That actually all things that we do, we do with that sense of joy, that sense of sense of deep peace, that deep sense of hilarity, that deep sense, yes, this is for my Christ, this is for my God, this is for my Lord, who loves me more than I love myself, who loves me beyond all measure, who has got a home for me that makes this worth nothing. Lord, I pray each of us walk out as the unknown woman, full of our identity in you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. 
To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.